Um, so it's my pleasure to um, bring Kathy Cody to all of you today and um, really looking forward to talking to her about her amazing book that um, came out just about a month ago. I'm sure many of you have seen it already. Um, and most of you, I think, will probably know uh, quite a bit about Kathy and know um, what her story is. Um, she is the youngest daughter of William F. Cody. And really, I think this book, it's probably fair to say, Kathy, is um, kind of um, a lifetime's work. <laughs> does it feel like that to you? Yes, it does, actually. I, it started about 14 years ago and um, with a, a few detours and, um, but after the um, uh, 2016 Centennial exhibit in Los Angeles, it took off. So it's been uh, about five years uh, until it was launched um, um, in September on the 14th. And it, it's really, it's wonderful. We feel really good. Uh, Joe Loria, co-author and Don Choi, um, a great team and the graphic artist, um, Andrew Byram is fabulous. <laughs> and so we're really happy and we hope you all enjoy it too. Well, it's a beautiful, beautiful book and really congratulations on, on making it because as most of you know I wrote a book too and I know how much work goes into it but it's really you know there are always hurdles that you have to overcome and and you had your fair share of them I think along the way and so to to have it you know land on our desks and enjoy it and and find out so much about not just your father's work but also who he was and we're going to be I'm um, talking about that quite a lot. So I'm just going to share my screen. Um, hopefully, just give me one second here. Uh, okay. Um, sorry, this always happens when we're trying to get our ducks in a row. Let's make sure I've got this here. Okay. Talk quietly amongst yourselves. Here we go. <laughs> Coming up. Okay, I've got one more thing I need to do. And then. I'm going to be with you. All right, so. Um, Kathy, let's um, talk first of all about um, growing up with your father about his personality and how how living with him and his profession as an architect in the desert really affected you. Um, well, his personality was um, very positive. Um, he had a, a laughter that kind of preceded him as he he came into a room. Um, you pretty much knew he was close by just by that. Um, he was he was an optimist and um, Russell Wade's associate said, you know, your father really saw the beauty in life and everything around him and the people he worked with and um, he created beautiful architecture. So um, I think from his skilled early beginnings um, learning how to draw and paint from his mother. And um, then um, he, of course, went to USC and um, enhanced his skills there. Um, he, it, it gave him a lot of confidence. And it also gave him the ability to come up with ideas quite quickly. And architects who have worked with him uh, said to me that they were just in awe at how fast he could come up with uh, a building uh, in front of his client and um, that they watched. And so uh, that's quite uh, an impressive thing for me to have known and, and other people to tell me. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah, I think, um, you know, you've told me that he was um, very, 
uh, interested in in knowing his clients and getting to know them. And but I think from a personal point of view, before we start talking about some of his projects, um, I I was curious to know a bit more about how you interacted with him. What you told me a story about um, going to see him at lunchtime or after school, and and just you know some of the the fun things that you used to do with him when he was still at work. Right. I, um, his office was the most fun place to be. If I wasn't, you know, at school, I would rather be up there. Um, he, uh, I went to job sites with them. I went to planning commission meetings. I met clients. Um, and um, I just kind of knew there was this protocol of not getting in the way because um, he was quite busy. But um, we would go to get our food and, and have a little picnic in his private office in the uh, at the office. And um, he would, at the planning commission meeting in Palm Springs, people would come in and sit at the allotted spaces and he would just go out like they're not even asking, bring in a chair for me to sit there. And I would be like eight or nine years old. Um, so there weren't other children at the meeting, but he was never self-conscious about what he did. And um, I, I think that is, is pretty impressive. And I don't think that people question what, why he would bring his kid into the meeting <laughs> because he, he contributed so much to the development of the planning commission. And so, um, and he was a relaxed person. He, he made people comfortable. Um, I think that was a, a great attribute of his. Um, right. Yeah. I think one, one of the, um, before I move on to the next slide, just to, um, this is a, a great, he loved all of you, obviously, very much. I mean, family was very important to him. And um, I read in your book that this uh, dog was a present from uh, some clients and that the dog came from the same family as Lassie. Yeah, well, from the breeder, <laughs> it could be a cousin, you don't know, but <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, uh, Jack rather, the rat and Benita, um, my father had uh, designed La Horizon in Palm Springs and um, our house was completed at the time, around the same time. And so the housewarming gift that they gave my dad was this beautiful collie. And uh, his name was Bo. We named him Bo. So somehow, we don't know how he's related, but he came from the same <laughs> Okay. So I'm going to um, jump into some of the Rancho Mirage projects because that's kind of why we're here, if you like. Um, so I'm going to talk about Thunderbird Country Club because um, Thunderbird Country Club was obviously very important to Rancho Mirage, but it was also really important to uh, the future of golf golf um golf clubs period and um your father who's shown here on the left of this picture is standing with frank bogart in the background um johnny dawson is in the front with his checkered tie um you've got uh, barney hinkle with the kind of grin behind johnny dawson lawrence hughes who was the golf course designer who i think is the shorter guy in the front um and this was a group that got together as they were really announcing Thunderbird Country Club. And then um, Johnny Dawson worked closely with your father to um, come up with this idea of putting home sites around the club and selling the home sites so that essentially that would pay for the club. And it was an idea that really hadn't been done before. And what your father was um, able to do was work with Lawrence Hughes again, the golf course designer, to integrate the home sites around the golf course in a way that made made it interesting both for homeowners to be living on the golf course but also made the golf course interesting and that was such a 
a unique um, achievement that no one had done before that. I mean, perhaps there might have been one or two houses built on a golf course, but to actually come up with this concept where the two were absolutely interlinked, I thought was um, really wonderful. And um, this master plan, although it's a little bit fuzzy, um, really shows uh, exactly how your father was able to um, put together a plan that worked alongside of the golf course. Okay, um, so um, some of these pictures are in Kathy's book, I have to say, and some of these Kathy has also uh, kindly provided. And um, this is an illustration of um, the golf uh, Thunderbird uh, Clubhouse, really. Um, and obviously, when the club first started, um, Kathy, your father took on a project that kind of existed already, some existing buildings. Mm -hmm. And um, and here's an amazing master plan of the whole site. Um, and then this is what it ended up looking like in in really this about 1954, I think. Um, the cottages were off to one side. And this was in the early days, the houses were just being built. Um, Thunderbird Country Club was um, really unique. Um, Cody came up with this idea of um, including a bar that overlooked the first tee. Um, Kathy, I've heard some amazing stories. I don't know if you have heard them too about how um, people really loved this bar because it gave them the opportunity to look over the bartender's head out to the golf course and see what was going on. Do you want to talk to us briefly about how much sort of entertainment and um, joy of life meant to your father? Well, I think um, when he got to know his clients, he would understand what was important to them. And many of his clients like to entertain. So bars were um, part of the um, pr um, planning of their home, or in this case, the club, um, and also golf, of course, and people uh, watching the golf outside the window and relaxing, having drinks, um, he could put this all together and, and have a really nice, comfortable environment. Um, he used this sunken bar in um, several of his residences following uh, Thunderbird. Um, but I, I was thinking earlier today that in Los Angeles, uh, well, while he was in USC and before, he was also doing some work with Cliff May. And um, I know Cliff May uh, was planning uh, the equestrian and ranch homes. So that was very effective at um, people whose, whose lifestyle centered around riding. And so their homes are right there next to the horses. So I would think that that kind of segued into his thinking of these are golfers. So why not have their home right on the golf course? And then of course the golf cart instead of the horse <laughs> allowed them to take them to the uh, clubhouse. And, right. Yeah. Um, you've just mentioned Cliff May, and I've I've flipped to um, uh, one of the first houses that was designed for the golf course, which of course was um, for Barney Hinkle, who was uh, one of the prime movers and um, at the golf course among the people that kind of worked with the team to come up with the ideas. And this is a house that kind of represents the. Um, the single story ranch style house that, that mostly in the first couple of years, especially at Thunderbird was very, very prevalent. Um, talk to us a little bit about um, Cliff May and, and your father's relationship with him. Um, they met, I, I know they knew each other as early as 1936 um, because that's the earliest a rendering of a house my father did for Cliff um, in San Diego, actually. Um, so um, they were not, they were in their 20s. I, my father was early 20s, Cliff made uh, older. 
And um, I think they were able to complement each other with their ideas. Um, my father could delineate and he could plan and Cliff May had some great ideas of how uh, you could live resort-like. And um, so um, I can't define exactly who is responsible for what, but I do know that they worked um, very effectively together and for many years. Right. So um, um, while you've been talking, I've flipped through a couple of uh, different houses that were um, designed by your father in those first early days. Um, we're now on to the D.B. McDaniels residence, but what they all have in common is that ranch style. So some, you know, a lot of them had the board and back and siding. Some of them had the cedar shaped roof um, and they had very much that whole indoor outdoor ranch style that Cliff May had made popular in California and that your father then um, in, introduced or made popular at Thunderbird in the early days. So there were several, these all these houses that I've just flipped through, McDaniel's house, George Cameron, Johnny Dawson, they were kind of in a row along Fairway Drive on Thunderbird and they were the closest really to the club the clubhouse itself. So they were very popular location and um, they were the first houses to be built. And this house is still there. The George Cameron one and the Johnny Dawson one, unfortunately aren't, but this house is still there, I'm happy to say. Um, the owner of it was going to be on this um, talk today. Um, so I'm going to come to the Jorgensen Mavis house, which um, many of you will be familiar with. We opened it up during Modernism Week um, the year before last, um, February 2020, seems like a million years ago. Um, but um, and some of you may have met Kathy there, too. Um, this house was designed um, for Earl Jorgensen, who was a, a steel magnate um, in Los Angeles. And um, it, to me, anyway, it's always represented a pivotal moment in uh, your father's design for desert modernism, because um, having designed Cliff May ranch style houses essentially um, at Thunderbird, even though he'd done much more interesting designs, obviously for your house and for things like um, uh, the Horizon Hotel and also the um, Del Marcos in Palm Springs. This was the, the first house at Thunderbird that really had the desert modern feel. So um, your father, was given this commission and he designed a house that had these huge overhangs um, that created a covered terrace um, and this amazing view out to the mountains. And so it was beautifully positioned on its site and sort of a raised site as well uh, on Clubview Drive. And this is a, a photograph looking at it from the other direction. Um, what what appeals to you about this house, Kathy? What what do you particularly like? Well, first, I'd like to mention that the other homes that you shared, um, they're like you say, more in the ranch style um, look with the stretched um, little slightly sloped roofs. Um, this house, I'm sure the Jurgensons visited our home to see it um, because what they have in common when you come into the Jurgensen's home is a sense of surprise, an element of surprise. Um, when you look at the outside, um, you see these beautiful stone blocks, but when you open the doors, you, you look at a garden in the, in the entry, in the foyer, and then to the left, you look out at this expansive view of the fairway. So here are the front doors and you can see the glass there. And he had this hush and flush um, detailing of the glass in the entry where it just went into the um, bordering material, like right into the wood, right into the floor and the ceiling. And um, so you could feel, you could sense that you could walk right through it. You know, um, that that garden there and also all over this 
floor plan is just similar to the Cody residence because our home, every room either had a garden view, even the bathrooms, or they had enclosed gardens or the atrium in the center of the house. So you would either look in this atrium or outside to the gardens. And this is the same plan, same type of plan that mm. he, continued, I, he continued to, to implement in his designs. I think the, the one of the most delightful things about the Jorgensen Mavis House, I mean, I love the design of it anyway, but I've always been um, intrigued by the, uh, sun courts as they're actually marked on this plan and um, he put them next to bathrooms quite often and so you had these amazing sort of little sunny atriums with palm trees growing out of them and rocks positioned just so so that when you were in the bathroom doing whatever you were doing you could look out and see um, you know a beautiful desert scape yeah you could have like a zen moment <laughs> it was quite beautiful you know yeah no it's a, a really delightful feature of this house and others um i included this aerial view because it's it's kind of fun to see at the top um right hand corner here is uh, the jorgensen house under construction in about 1954 and then this house here is the barney hinkle house and next door to it, this was another house that your father designed um, called the L.L. Oaks um, residence. And then up at the top is the Hoagie Carmichael house. So um, this is a club view where we had our uh, Modernism Week um, uh, get together event two years ago. So um, let's talk about Tamarisk a little bit. Uh, Tamarisk was a bit different from Thunderbird because um, your father wasn't uh, as he wasn't really involved in the design of the golf course. The golf course got designed first, and then your father was invited to design a clubhouse. It wasn't that the clubhouse was an afterthought, but um, the people that uh, started Tamarisk were kind of more interested in golf to start with, and they used Wonder Palms, um, the hotel, which was. Uh, adjacent and had also uh, been part of the land, um, they used that as the clubhouse for a couple of years. So this is an early rendering of the clubhouse that um, your father designed. And then um, like the Thunderbird crew, we also um, had the Tamaris crew. So your father is second from the right in this picture, um, looking a bit doubtful about Harpo Marx clowning around on his spade. <laughs> um, this was for the groundbreaking for the club. So this would have been in about 1953, I think. Um, second from the left is Lou Halper, who um, was the founder of Tamarisk. So then at Tamarisk, um, the house building started a little bit later on. Um, like Thunderbird, there were home sites that were um, designed around the club um, and also uh, two or three roads inside the club where people had houses looking out onto the fairways. Um, but there was um, one house in particular that was there quite early on, and this was uh, designed by your father as well. And it's it's actually one of the, uh, I think it's, if it's not the earliest house at Tamrisk, it's certainly one of the earliest. Um, this is the Austin Peterson residence. And um, Austin Peterson was with um, the Armed Forces Network. He was a radio guy. He also did uh, the Colgate show and uh, he lived in this house as far as we can figure out for only a couple of months. And then he sold it to this person, Frank Sinatra. Um, I was talking to Kathy about this house the other day because for the longest time, I didn't really notice until I looked at the rendering very closely that um, this isn't really a long gable. It's kind of two intersecting um, sloping roofs really and they they kind of meet in the middle but one roof is sliding up over the other one um, so Sinatra um, had Cody 
after he bought this house, he had your father um, design some additional rooms. And um, unfortunately, Kathy doesn't have any particular memories of um, hanging out at Sinatra's house, right, Kathy? <laughs> No. <laughs> um, so then there was um, this was 1956. This is the uh, David Holland residence, and um, this is a, a really beautiful house still there. Um, one of the features of this house and the next couple of houses we're going to talk about is um, this covered walkway with these very uh, narrow supports and a, a kind of steel frame um, covered to the walkway and um, your father was actually really um, interested in creating these surprise entrances for people correct this is a picture of um, the house that Kathy grew up in designed by her father would you like to tell us a bit more about this Kathy yeah sure um, on the right uh the awning is actually made of turquoise glass with um, safety glass. So it has like wire mesh in it, but it um, the sun came through and it reflected a beautiful cooling turquoise color on the light, almost white tile. The tile went through the house. So there was a, a lot of elements uh, that continued um, through the house, like the, the shallow steps, they define the planters and ponds and different living areas. Um, the next slide, Melissa, shows a front gate at the end right here is um, visible from the street. So um, the visitor would come to that door and on the right was a doorbell um, with an intercom to the inside of the house. But when you went through the door, you, um, came into under the, um, you were under that turquoise awning. Um, and to the left of that is an enclosure of the adobe uh, block or brick. And that was uh, the front guest house, the entrance to the front guest house. So here he's separating the guest house from the master house. Um, and he did that uh, with several other homes that he designed. This uh, Gillian, Gillian residence in particular, um, he has a gate and then this long um, walkway to the, to the house, but next to the gate and the carport, he has um, a guest house like he did with ours. Um, yeah, so the guest house is set to the right of the pool and, and separate from <clears throat> the main house. And then, um, in fact, that was also the case for the Jaffe house. Um, so jumping um, ahead to the 60s, but I wanted to kind of show the sequence between the hollow, the Gillen, um, Kathy's house and this house, because they all um have this uh, commonality and um the jaffe i um have to say for any of you who've ever seen it is a very um it's a stunning house but one of the things that kathy and i talk about is this element of surprise that really um i think comes to bear in houses like the jaffe house can you talk to us about that kathy uh yes uh, like our house with that door as a gate the Jaffe house has gates that, um, that are within a wall on, from the street, vis visible from the street, but you don't see the house. And then when you, you come through those two gates, you, you see this amazing view. Um, you have the passageway to the front doors, which is seen uh, in the slide ahead behind the chaise lounges there. And it uh, ends to the right at the front door. And then you see the pool to the right and the detached guest house is um, to the left of this, um, of this um, passageway. Yeah, and, and here we're kind of looking at the very, um, on the very left of the screen is the covered walkway. So um, <clears throat> this covered walkway actually extends out beyond the front gate of the house. So from the street, when you're looking at this house, all you see are the doors as Kathy described, 
and then you kind of have this um, shelter, almost a porch in front of those gates, but then you walk in and you walk down this pathway and that um, covered walkway that you see a kind of hint of at the at the front gates continues down. And um, for me, this, this element of your father's design with these entryways, with these very narrow steel supports and a kind of balance of, um, light and air and um, uh, positive spaces and negative spaces, I think, are always apparent. So there's always a kind of um, um, yin and yang of positive and negative spaces around these entryways too, which I think is so fascinating. Also, uh, Melissa, with the Jaffe House, um, it's transparent with you looking from the pool through the living room, the, those windows that you see ahead, you mm -hmm. see right through it to the fairway, which right. is so typical of my father's work. And I th and also I'm talking of the and the sort of see through quality. There's always there are quite often surprising pieces of glass in surprising places. And actually in the wall to the Jaffe house, there are um, pieces, full height pieces of frosted glass that you kind of don't really notice until you stand there and look at it. Because when you first look at it, all you see is a wall, and then you see these kind of in, interspersed pieces of glass. And um, when you get inside the, and you're by the pool, you also have this space here that kind of separated the kitchen from the maid's quarters, I think. And then on the other side, you have a similar space that separated the house from the guest quarters on the left hand side. So, yes, we could we could talk all day about the Jaffe house, but it, it's a beautiful house for sure. And um, as our you know, all the houses that your father was designing in the desert. Um, there's a funny story I just want to talk about the Jaffe house, because this actually has to do with um, your father's relationship to his clients. So I was told by Jaffe's sons that um, their father very much enjoyed the design process with your father. And I had also heard that in the early days of designing the house, uh, that the two of them sat down with a bottle of whiskey and sketched out a plan for the house. And when I went to Cal Poly and looked in the files for the Jaffe house, sure enough, there were loads and loads of sketches. Now, I didn't see any whiskey spills on any of the paper. <laughs> so I can't and I can't attest to, you know, what went down. But there were certainly a lot of sketches and I got I got the clear kind of feeling that the two of them very much kind of worked together to make this house something special. You know, Melissa, I saw this slide this morning and there's something curious, the um, the printed text in the upper left hand corner. Has nothing to do with it. Because <laughs> okay. it says 52. In I know, no, it's it's I, something that Cal Poly stuck on there. So I'm not sure what that's about. <laughs> It's not but this, <laughs> no, that's right. But actually, at the very top, I don't know if people can make it out. There is actually an elevation uh, for the house, and I, and it doesn't kind of to me. It doesn't relate to the way the house is today. And there are other things about the sketch that don't relate because the pool is in a different location, really. And so there were there were a lot of a lot of design and a lot of ideas went into that house. I think it's safe to say. I think that elevation at the top, Melissa, you're looking oh, from you're looking from the street. So what uh -huh. you really do see is just that wall, and you see the gates. You see, and then oh yes, that's the true. Wall, you see the roof structure. So it is pretty close to what you see. If you oh, you're right. Street. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for pointing that out. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Um, we're going to talk now about the Nicoletti residence. Now, this is one that sadly doesn't really exist anymore. So, um, but um, it's a, a famous house um, in terms of your father's uh, design. And um, it was known as Little El Dorado because it featured these kind of flattened arches and had was designed around the same time, um, I think, as El Dorado Country Club. Um, this was the elevation that looked out across the valley from Thunderbird Heights. 
um and uh the top elevation was the front elevation from the street um and unfortunately it has been severely remodeled but we're going to talk about it the way your father designed it um when i was um looking at this picture earlier in the week i looked at it for quite a long time and what really caught my eye and um was the fact that this arrangement of shallow steps was um i come across them quite frequently in your father's designs kathy and um just talk about if you've got any insights into those um well i can see that here there's you know like it's a comfortable transition from the lowest uh, elevation to the middle elevation it's if you were to walk one step then the next one and then the next one the, it's just a comfortable um ergonomic i would say <laughs> uh, change of level well he did that in our house too and also in the Jaffe house, not the Jaffe, the um, Jurgensen, uh, the pool steps, you see at the end of the pool, they continue beyond the pool. And I can see that uh, he's done this here with the upper set of steps. Um, it continues uh, beyond the, the path to the door. And in our own personal home, the steps in the house extended beyond the wall of the house and defined areas outside too. Uh -huh. Yeah, I think and we've talked a little bit about surprising elements leading up to the entrance and this house doesn't have a, a surprise gate particularly, but what it does have is this um, sort of poetry in motion of the lower planter on the left hand side that kind of leads up to these steps. And then you have the higher level on the right hand side. So your your eye is taken across the um, the front of the house in the, in a very pleasing way, I think. Um, one of the things that Kathy and I talked about a bit um, was uh, the door designs and um, this kind of flattened arch that was repeated across uh, this elevation of the house and inside. Um, but also uh, lanterns were often given by um, your father to his clients once the project was complete. Yes, and also, um, I don't know if you know, Melissa, but those doors are gates. So they open up to the pool side, to the pool. Right. Side. Okay, yeah, and then the- um, But they don't actually open it up in, into the house. They open into an outdoor area, correct. Thank you, Kathy, for reminding me. And then um, to the left is the guest house and to the ah. right would be the house proper to the right. Okay. Yeah. Good to know. Um, these were just some sketches of the doors that I came across. So it was a, a idea that your father was working on and I came across quite a lot of iterations. Um, <clears throat> Louise Nicoletti, who was his client, was very like Dr. Jaffe was, as far as I could make out, very involved in the design herself. She was quite uh, hands on and involved and it, it, as far as I can tell it took um, at least a couple of years for this house to be completed I think probably because she was changing her mind or adding things <laughs> she did <laughs> so um, Kathy was talking about the gates opening to the pool there was a huge pool terrace and um, this is a picture of um, your father walking around the pool um, and I he believe, I believe uh, uh, Melissa the, the gates are to the right of this slide okay yeah and that's probably the living room that he's in front of right right um, this actually shows you a plan this house is actually on the corner for anyone who uh, lives in Thunderbird Heights or or visits it's on the corner of Sonora and Tonopah and um, you can actually identify it to this day because of the one of the planters in front is still there. So um, if you're not sure, you can kind of see it, just a hint. Um, but this was the plan and you can see how much space there was for entertaining around the pool. And um, what you see in white is really kind of what the rooms were and everything else was kind of essentially outdoor space or balcony space or patio space of one sort or another. 
Um, so it was now the house has been built all the way around so that there aren't any, you don't have this kind of big uh, sort of interaction with the outdoor space so much. Um, Melissa, I just wanted you to notice that the, the shape of the pool, the sides are bowed for that arch, you know, that soft arch. And the, also the walls, the glass walls of the sides of the living room, they mm -hmm. open up so Louise could have huge parties that flowed all the way out around the pool and all the way out onto the deck terrace overlooking the valley. And of course the obligatory bar. <laughs> and this was an indoor outdoor bar. So the, as far as I understand it, the, the um, sliding doors kind of intersected the bar. Yes. Mm -hmm. Which is a, a pretty lovely detail. I don't have no idea if they're still there. So if you were, if it was raining outside, you could still be inside and have a drink. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> okay, so we're going to move ahead to uh, the 70s. And um, by 1971, um, your father was obviously extremely well established and he was commissioned to design this house for the Rubensteins at Tamaris Country Club. And um, it uh, became a, a sort of Spanish hacienda design. And um, this was a, a really Gladys Rubenstein's uh, collaboration with your father. She wanted something more in this style. Is that correct, I, Kathy? Yes. Um, I, she's like a woman's. Uh, her husband was a woman's dream husband because he let her do everything. And um, so she came into my father's office with um, clippings of Mexican haciendas. And um, so she gave him all her clippings and they had their meeting. They, uh, the Rubensteins went up to Seattle where their, their summer home was and she expected to come back and see everything finished for her. And then she came into the office and saw what my father had and it was not what she had in mind. So um, they uh, talked again and I mean, she could have said, forget it, but she didn't. She said, I'm leaving again for the season and I'm gonna come back. What are you gonna have for me? So she told, told me that when she came back, my father had designed something so over what she could have expected. It was way beyond and she was so happy. So, and she collected art. So um, there were, the interior walls were uh, planned for her collection. And she uh, had a huge collection of Chihuly glass because she helped start him with his first studio in Seattle. Um, and um, so, that was very uh, important for her to be able to display art. And on these, um, these side walls, these niches that have shelves, um, the, the shelf itself is, has a light in the back and uh, there's a space between the back and the shelf so that it could uh, flood the, the niche and backlight the objects. So it was really carefully thought out and um, she was very happy. Of course, there was the there was the Claire Falkenstein doors that um, were just gorgeous um, for the front door. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think um, you know this house is quite has a certain similarity with the Nicoletti house in as much as it was really built for entertaining as well as uh, for the artwork. And so um, what you're seeing in this photograph, and this is an, an older photograph of the house, it's um, obviously been changed somewhat since then, a little bit on the inside, although I think a lot of the original features are still there. Um, but what you're seeing is a courtyard in the middle of it, and that courtyard um, had at the time um, when your father, um, when the Rubensteins had the house, an electronic roof that could open to the elements or not, as the case may be. Um, but this living room and uh, the pool room on the other side and the guest house all had access to this interior courtyard. And so the house was essentially, the guest house was sort of the front pavilion 
and then the um the rubenstein's house was the rear pavilion and they were connected by certain rooms as well as the courtyard um but it was a, a house that the kitchen i mean the kitchen is amazing and it goes all the way around the corner at the back and has the most enormous um uh, kind of st butler's storage pantry areas and heaven knows what else and um big maids quarters off the kitchen and so this was a kitchen really built not for the rubensteins to cook in but for their staff to cook in i always got that impression anyway well they um when they came to the desert they brought their cook and in and they did have a maid that stayed at the house here but um so on the back side of this kitchen is the the cook's quarters and the permanent maid's home or quarters mm -hmm. too. Yeah, um, beautiful house. And I think some of you may have visited it and we had it on the tour about three years ago, um, but hopefully we'll be able to open it again one day. Um, this is the outdoor terrace. Um, you can see some of the Rubenstein's artwork by the pool in the background. Um, the designer the interior designer of this house worked quite closely with your father on uh, some of these details too and um you know one of the things that people often talk to me about is the flooring because uh, these um saltillo tiles essentially is what they are um they were kind of a thing in in the early 70s and um i remember having a conversation with one of the owners who thought about pulling them all out and putting in terrazzo flooring and i said i don't know that it's that's going to be the right look for this house you know so fortunately he didn't because i think it could kind of would have messed with the uh, hacienda right so you remember what she wanted initially was a mexican feeling a hacienda so she got her courtyard and she got her flooring <laughs> The flooring isn't that easy to walk on, I have to say. There are moments if you're wearing high heels for an event that you kind of curse it. <laughs> but it's 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 uh, it's beautiful. And it, the um, designer Barry Brukov told me that they used um, you know used motor oil to stain the floors before they sealed them, and that was uh, quite a commonly used technique at the time. Mm. But the um, indoor outdoor space in this house is really fabulous. And here you've got a, another huge terrace with views out to the golf course. And um, this is essentially a south facing terrace. So your father created an even bigger than normal um, terrace to allow them to entertain and also stay shaded. Um, I just wanted to mention that often he designed his own lamp fixtures. And oh yes the, the wall sconce there on the above the built-in that's a built-in sofa actually so you can see the texture of the stucco on the bottom and on the arms um he made a larger version similar to that um for the light in the front that was his housewarming gift to the rubensteins and and he also designed the front doors on this house correct yes the gates. Yes. The gates, yeah. yeah. Um, and part of the big entertaining area of this house was um, another sunken bar, of course, and um, some uh, beautiful uh, built ins and the pool tables built for them. Um, and then this room, unusually, I, this kind of always reminds me a little bit of the Abernathy house with this kind of, uh, how would you describe the ceiling? um ah yeah good i'm having a senior moment i used to know okay. you know it's kind of like a low flattened pyramid you know but then yes. it, it has this the the ceiling that it meets it go extends and then you have lighting that reflects up on it mm -hmm. Of course, it has recessed lights in it too. Yes, the recessed lights are wonderful. And um, this house has, in the true tradition of early 70s houses, has amazing volumes and the ceiling. I don't know how high the roofs, the ceiling height is, um, but in this room and in the living room, um, the ceiling heights are really 
pretty substantial. So let's move along. Um, so the last one that your father was involved in, and this did um, get discovered really just as you were working on the book, um, was this house, which is the Ryback residence. And um, this is at Tamara's Country Club. And um, the people that bought the house um, a few years ago found all the original drawings and found this rendering. And um, I believe they showed it to you and you said, yes, that that's something that my father was probably involved in at the time. Um, it was done by Cody Sheehy Architects, which um, was the iteration of your father's design practice by the early 70s, correct? Right, yes. Um, they were junior partners and when he had his, he had a stroke in early spring of 1973, so my thought about this house is um, he might have started designing it before the stroke, but I actually feel that um, she, he and my uncle, Jay, who the other partner, um, had a lot to do with the design because they had to finish it for my father. So I'm not sure when my father met the Ryback family um, and how much he was involved in um its completion right um that's what the house looks like uh, today and so you can see that it um clearly was as your father um and his colleagues at the time intended um and uh it hasn't there's a, a real similarity or relationship to the rubenstein house it has a kind of 70s hacienda look to it um, and uh, with the red tile roofs and um, a lot of similar finishes. And I th I've always felt it had a bit of a relationship with Palm Springs Library as well. So I've, I've kind of put them side by side before now and you can see it. So it's a seventies styling really that comes into play there, I think. I, I think this house has um, a lot of the partners design in it. Interesting, yeah. Um, so I'm going to end up the talk just um, for the next few minutes just by talking about something that I've come across a lot, which I always find intriguing, and that's um, your father's site planning and um, some of the work he did with communities. Um, and so this is um, a fun one. Um, it's a Thunderbird, an early plan for a Thunderbird shopping center. And this was designed to be, um, as far as I can make out, a north, would it be northwest of the, no, not north. Yeah, let's see. West of the highway, Highway 111, kind of where Hunt the Thunderbird Heights ended up. I think, yeah, it's on the side of uh, Thunderbird Estates, the high end. Yes. yes. And um, your father had all these wonderful in the top left hand corner, he had um, decided exactly which shops were going to be where and what services were going to be where. So in amongst the shops and services and professions, he also had a whole list of craftspeople. So he had a ceramics crafts, he had an artist, he had a photographer, he had a sculptor, um, he had uh, model making. And so he really let his imagination fly on this one. And down in the bottom left-hand corner, this kind of boomerang shape was designed to be a drive-in. So, you know, it would have been fun if it was still there, but it didn't come to pass, but it's, it's a fun one to show everybody. Well, this is an extension of his planning for Thunderbirds. So he's telling us the members, you know, not just golf isn't everything. You can be creative and you have this, you could have this at your disposal and come over here and, and make things and then see a drive-in movie too, I guess. <laughs> Well, it's all, you know, he, he loved uh, people to have a good time, correct? He, he really wants people to have really fun. Enjoy life. Um, this is the site plan for the cottages at Thunderbird Country Club. And um, Kathy and I have walked around these together. And I think the thing that always um, enchants me about the cottages at Thunderbird is the fact that when you walk around them, you feel like you're walking through a village. 
Right. Yes. He he never liked to put things in Sarah Dranks. Things were always had that element of surprise that we've talked about already. Yeah, and also they're probably oriented for some privacy too in view. Yes, absolutely. Privacy, you know, was as important to your father as um as being an, in an entertainment environment too. So he, he liked to give people privacy and, and separate them from each other so they could have downtime and not be in each other's faces all the time. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, just a, a postcard showing you uh, the cottages there. And then this is a Blue Skies Village. Again, this was a, a plan that your father was asked to uh, design for the frontage development for Blue Skies Trailer Village. And um, this was going to be a fully fledged commercial center, which sadly um, never got commissioned, but um, there's a, a wonderful uh, googie style restaurant in the middle of it, right? <laughs> um, and all sorts of other beautiful things. This, um, this is in the book, isn't it, Kathy? This image, I think. Melissa, I need to take a quick break. Would okay. You talking? I'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to flip through the rest of these and just um, talk about the um, the communities that Cody designed. Um, what happened in Rancho Mirage in the 50s was that um, people started building um, smaller communities around the country clubs. And this was actually the very first one, and it was designed by um, William F. Cody. It was a group of five houses that were built around a central pool. And as far as I can make out, this was the first one. It was built um, by Lou Manso, who um, was involved in getting the Ryder Cup brought to Thunderbird Country Club in 1955 and Ernie Breach, who was chairman of the Ford Motor Company at the time and who gave um, the name of the Thunderbird to the car, also had a house here. Um, Thunderbird North is a, a site, this was a site plan that um, Cody did for Thunderbird North in 1955. And this was a group of 10 houses that were all going to be custom designed. And um, Cody designed some, at least three of the houses at Thunderbird North, um, but this was the master plan that he did for uh, Pollard Simons, who was the developer. And um, this was Pollard Simons' house on Country Club Drive, which Cody designed. Next door to it, you've got the Jimmy Hines house, also by Cody. And on the left over here, you've got the Moncrief house, um, also by Cody. And I think he may have designed one or two others there, um, but unfortunately the drawings haven't come to light. Uh, this was a house for Eddie Lowry, and it has a lot of hallmarks of being Cody as well. Um, the Jimmy Hines residence, Kathy and I have kind of scratched our head over this one. So the Jimmy Hines residence, um, I think the owners are on, on this call. Um, it is at Thunderbird North, as I just showed you, but um, for reasons um, that we don't fully understand, and Jimmy Hines was the original golf pro at Thunderbird, um, this drawing actually says Tamaris Country Club at the bottom of it. And <laughs> so we, we, at least we have it, and this image is in the book, um, but as we know, it's actually at Thunderbird North, and Jimmy Hines was the original golf pro there. And the house, this is essentially the house that's there today, so I think we can feel confident that um whatever happened um it didn't get built at tamaris country club <laughs> yeah, I, I i could say uh well he did so much work in tamaris and thunderbird he just might have had some moment of you know forgetting he was doing a thunderbird and wrote tamaris by a mistake right absolutely <laughs> that is it sounds completely feasible to me. I know it. Given how much your father was working on at this time, it's really completely forgivable, right? <laughs> they begin with a T. <laughs> yes, exactly. I get them confused too. 
Um, so this was the inside of the uh, Moncrief residence at Thunderbird North. And um, it was kind of this uh, group of houses was sort of a Texas hangout. So Pollard Simons, who had created Thunderbird North, was very good friends with Eisenhower and um, in fact went to live at El Dorado once Eisenhower decided to, to uh, build a house there. And Moncrief was very good friends with Eisenhower too. So it was kind of Texas corner down at that end of uh, Country Club Drive. Uh, this is the Pollard Simons residence that um, we've talked about uh, that your father designed. And then um, just flipping on to some other communities. This was also at Thunderbird. They were called the Fourth Fairway Cottages. They're still there. They, some of them have been kind of messed around with. And um, this is where they're located, just off Highway 111 on Paxton Drive. And um, I've come across a brochure for Thunderbird Terrace. And I think your father must have planned the site um, because it has this kind of triangular relationship like these do here as well. Um, but I don't think he designed any houses there, not that I've found anyway. Um, coming up to the end here, 10th Fairway. Um, so this is Tamaris, what everyone thinks of today as Cody Court. Actually, your father was commissioned to master plan a much, much bigger development along the 10th Fairway at Tamarisk back in 1957. And this was going to have a hotel, which is marked at the top of this plan. And then um, this is kind of where Peacock Circle is today. And a couple of these houses, as far as we can make out, did get built. So this was the Charles Jones house, um, which I think is, uh, it's in my book. And I think it's in Cathy's as well. Um, and a couple of these other houses along here got built. But the, um, they never got planning permission. They, nobody wanted a big hotel development. Um, so some of the houses got built and then that was it. Um, but what then happened was that um, back in about 10 years later, your father was asked to um, come up with a plan for uh, the 10th Fairway condominiums. And it was a group of um, small there were 3000 square foot houses um built around a swimming pool and uh, fronting onto the 10th fairway at tamaris country club and so this gives you um, an idea of what that then became these were uh, mostly built in 1969 1970 and um, they had a lot of the characteristics of cody's work with these um vertical and horizontal, very thin uh, planes of, um, of um, you know, either slumpstone brick or stucco, and also floor to ceiling glass that faced out to the golf course. But then they had sort of funny inset, um, not funny, but beautiful adobe style characteristics on the other side. So facing the kind of private street, the doors and the windows have a kind of deep set stucco, almost adobe feel to them, as does um, the chimney, to my to my mind. Um, coming up to uh, the end of these communities, Sky Mountain. Um, this is one we've never found particularly um, Cody designs for, except for one um, apartment building, which is down in this left hand corner. Um, a developer decided he was going to uh, blow up all these hillsides along Highway 111. And um, there were some condominium buildings built up here. And then your father was asked to design um, some apartment buildings. And as far as we can make out, this is the only one. It's called Indian Springs. And um, it was co. It, the interesting, curious thing to me about this was that Al Beadle, who was an Arizona architect, was um, actually listed on the drawings as a um, associate. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see his name on the bottom right hand corner. Um, Kathy, we've just got a couple of minutes. Do you want to um, add anything to? Um... Yeah. Um, uh... 
Yes. Well, I can say that Al, Al Beadle and my father were, were good friends. Um, they admired each other's work and um, on the project for Western Savings in Phoenix, um, they collaborated on that, um, doing designs of different parts of it. So um, I, I'm sure something like this, I'm not sure exactly how much Al had participated in this, but when I look at the elevation drawing, I see my father's hand, his trees and um, people. So I believe that uh, the, the design would have come from him, but Al often um, worked with him, maybe did the uh, working drawings or helped him do the floor plan. I don't know. Right. right. Um, but I do know I, uh, Ned Sawyer was at the presentation um, on Friday and I got to speak to him and his wife Beverly um, for a good hour in the afternoon. And um, he, he was in Al's office as a student and after graduating from college. And he, um, Al would bring him over to Cody's office. And he, first time he took him, he says, I've got to take you to see the Springs restaurant. He says, I, this architect, Bill, he, he can take so many different types of materials. I bring this up, Melissa, because you talked about the Adobe. And so he could take like Adobe as in our house or stone as in the Springs restaurant and wood, um, terrazzo, glass, steel. And Al Beadle said he, he could bring it all together and create a symphony. And Al was just mesmerized by my dad's ability to take so much texture, so many different materials and detail them so that they actually worked and created a symphony. And so that was something that Ned shared with me on Friday. I love that. How, how, how wonderful to hear that. That's so beautiful. Yeah. I think we're going to um, stop there and uh, invite people to uh, ask questions, uh, maybe unmute yourself and, and wave your hand if you want to ask a question and um, fire away. Do I, do I answer? No. <laughs> Shall we unmute everybody? Is that what we should do? Okay, we're gonna allow you to unmute yourself. So now you could, should be able to unmute yourself. This question thing sometimes take, takes a little bit. So if anybody um, wants to wave their hand. Hi. <laughs> 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 Thank you. <laughs> no questions? You can now unmute yourself. I can see I can see a couple of um I can see three Cody homeowners on screen right now. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I can see Claudia, the owner of the Hinkle House. I can see Kelly, the owner of the Jimmy Hines House. And I can see Annette. Welcome, Annette, who owns a DB McDaniel's house. Oh, good. <laughs> oh, this is Bob Berg and Kathy. I just want to say congratulations on your book. It is just beautiful. It is, it's such a trove. It's, it's, you can spend in so much time going through and going back and looking at them again. I've been in a number of the homes, which I con consider myself very fortunate to have been able to do so. And uh, it is just a treasure to have. And this session was most enjoyable. Thank you so very much. Well, thank you, Bob. Thank you very much. Okay, so this is your opportunity. Kelly, do you, did you wanna say something? Yep. First of all, thank thank you both for setting this up. The book is fantastic. Um, as a Cal Poly San Luis Obispo alumni, obviously the connection is super cool, but fantastic book. Um, a, a, a question with regards to, so we're in the Jimmy Hines. Obviously this is was built and designed in the 50s. It, it seems like there was a transition from your father where it was 
um, stone, wood siding felt like it feels very like strong. And, and then it moved towards more glass post and beam was is in the 60s and 70s. Was that like a transition that you've talked about or thought about? Um, mm -hmm. or um, well, it's interesting because um, our home was finished in 1952 in Palm Springs and um, it was steel construction. So I think he was adept at um, creating different types of uh, homes with different types of structural material. Um, your home, for some reason, I just happened to go by at a time when an architect was remodeling it and he had a set of the original plans that he had used to make his um, changes from um, and I was pleased with what he was doing so I don't remember exactly the changes that he made on your home but um, I, I was pleased with what he was he was showing me that he had planned to do um, but um, I don't know where he got those original plans either so I'm not sure what your plant, I don't remember what your house is made from. Is it just wood, wood frame? Would it be just a wood frame home? It was both, it, would, it had the, the very Cody-esque wood paneling with the vertical um, paneling, beautiful, super strong stone fireplace that really is the anchor okay. to the home. And, and then to your point, we had, backyard facing windows which have been upgraded to dual pane okay. um, obviously for energy efficiency and probably some level of wear and tear so it is like the the front of it is is feels um very secure and then the back is this beautiful opening to the pool in the mountain so it's, it's i mean that's why we bought the home for one one of many reasons well, that's good I, i've driven by it and it looks really nice. Your home looks great. <laughs> yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, it's a fantastic piece of Cody history for sure. On the curb, it looks so nice. <laughs> great. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Does uh, anyone else have any questions? We, if not, we'll we'll shut it down and and thank Kathy for for being here and giving us the opportunity to talk about her father's work and of course talk about the the book and and show um we did um in your invite you should have also received the opportunity to um get a discount um the publishers are offering a discount i think it was something like 20 percent. so it's a pretty hefty discount um, so anyone who hasn't bought this beautiful book, Master of the Mid-Century, The Architecture of William F. Cody, um, this is a great opportunity to, to buy it. Um, and um, Kathy is going to be around for Modernism Week in February, obviously. So if you buy it now and you turn up at another event, she might even sign it for you. <laughs> um, <laughs> You never know. Um, but yes, I mean, you'll be doing lots of book signings. So I'm sure people have an opportunity to talk to you in person in February, if, if not before. So um, thank you again, Kathy. And um, I'm going to close it out there. I think everyone's ready to go and have their Bloody Marys and their Sunday brunches, right? Thank you, Melissa. It's been really fun. Nice thank seeing you everybody. very much, Kathy. <laughs> thank you.